start recording to have officially started this class. So uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is um, doing well and everything. I see just uh, 60, half of the class today. So we'll see where is the other one, probably they're gonna miss the extra credit and stuff like that. But anyways, I'm glad that you made it. I mean, actually we have 17 with Juliana's baby over there. So that's good. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> today we are switching a little bit of topic. You know, we are really learn about uh, how the uh, the cell divides, the type of cells that we have somatic and gametes or sexual um, cells. Somatic cells are going to divide through mitosis. Uh, sexual cells or gametes are going to uh, divide through meiosis. There's going to be a chrom chromosomic reduction in meiosis from diploid or 2N to haploid or only 1N. So the purpose of that is because when you have reduction of chromosomes, so then you have only 50% of your gametes, then this gamete is going to look for the other gamete that has the other half, you know, when you say like, you are me, uh, my other half. So actually that's uh, when it matter of reproduction that actually it is true, like 15, 50%. So usually mother and par and dad or like parents are going to join 50-50 to make a, a, a haploid organism. Um, something that I didn't mention last time is like in other type of organisms, there are a type of frogs, they can be triploid or tetraploids or heptaploids, hexaploids. That means that they have several, um, um, several chromosomes like not only two, but they have like three or four or five or six, but that's like really, really, really rare cases. But in our case as humans and most of the vast majority of other eukaryotic organisms, we have only the, uh, with sexual reproduction, we have only one chromosome from uh, the female side and one chromosome from the male side, so then we are diploids. So don't forget on Wednesday, so this is going to be kind of like a long week for Bio15, because what's going to happen is that we have today lecture, I hope just to last again, like about two hours or something. I added some examples of something that we need to work a lot to understand better how um, we transfer or traits or, or like how we look like to our um, children. So I added some extra exercises that we can work on that today. Um, but uh, we're going to finish that on Wednesday. We have laboratory, but also at the same time, I will be opening exam number, which number is, if exam is this one? Number three, right? Exam number three, which is going to be cells and cell division only. So the topic is going to be a little bit shorter, but I want to have the exam during this week. So I'm going to actually going to open it on Wednesday and leave it open until Sunday. So you will have several days in which you will be able to start. But again, I want you to finish the exam before coming, for, uh, going to spring break because I don't want to have you studying anything during spring break. I just want you to rest and I want to also grade it before spring break and I can have my break too. So um, also uh, I am considering um, having probably, and I will email you, uh, the week after spring break or the week after after, um, just a dedicated time for um, the special project review. I want to see how students are doing over there. So I just want to make sure that we are actually um, and having progress over there with a the special project. So if you are not actually doing anything yet for the special project, just expect from me to push you a little bit to have something for two or three weeks from now because I want to see progress. Remember, this is 15% of the um, of the final grade, so I want you to succeed. So I want to make sure that uh, you are doing well over there. Uh, so a little bit of a lot of stuff to do during this week. There are also some extra credit that I already put on Canvas. So if you go to module. Um, nine just let me try to open my modules over here give me one second thanks internet is kind of slow again so if you will forgive me if i if i'm gone just wait for me two three minutes and i'll be back with the, with the internet okay 
So just let me share my screen and then have, okay, so I have on the page of modules, if you go all the way to the bottom, you're gonna see the uh, genetics extra credit, which is uh, which are going to be five extra credit points. So if you wanna do it, is the due date is right after spring break. So the um, extra credit is just some exercises of Punnett squares and probabilities that we will learn to do today. So we will work on that, and then you'll be able to submit it until April 11th, which is like almost two weeks from now. And then once you upload it, I'll grade it, and then I'll give you those extra credit, okay? So I'll assign it already like that. So if you have time to do it, it's not mandatory, but also it's gonna help you to improve your uh, grades over here. So any question before we move on to the lecture? No questions for anything? No? All right, so let's go to the lecture of today. And today we'll be talking about a really, really cool um, topic, which is genetic and heredity. So we're gonna learn today uh, how we pass information from, uh, just let me take away this title for now, how we're going to transfer uh, our information from generation to generation. And also we're gonna learn how we do it how the probabilities and the frequencies of these are going to happen. Before that, we're gonna learn a little bit of a vocabulary of um, some new words that we need to learn before of that. We're gonna learn a little bit of history, which is going to go back to the late 1800s. So all these has been discovered by the late 1800s. It was forgotten for a little bit, but then it was like, um, recovered by other scientists and then with the work of Charles Darwin that I'm pretty sure everyone heard about him. Uh, we actually mix those two theories of uh, Mendel's genetic uh, theory and Darwin's uh, theory of evolution. And then now we came up with all the information that we know about how we transfer genes to get from generation to generations and how this affects evolution. All right, so don't forget, these are going to be for both, both editions, chapters 14 and 15. Mainly the most information is going to be on 13, but in chapter 15 we are, this is the place in which we are going to learn more about how we get to the probabilities and chances of breeding, et cetera, et cetera. So um, chapter 14 and 15. So um, I'm asking you over here, um, sometimes you're walking with your dad or your mom and then the neighbor sees you uh, or somebody sees you and there you're like, hey, you look more uh, more like your dad than your mom. So, you know, like they like sometimes you have features that they tell you that you look more than to one party than to the other one. Even if I was telling you before, we are getting 50 and 50 percent from each parent. Right. So we are literally getting 50 percent from each one of them. But how come? We look more uh, like to my, for example, I look more than to my mom than to my dad. So people are wondering why do we look more to one side than the other one? Or sometimes we just look like at the average, exactly right in the middle. Some features of my mom, some features of my mom, one side of the family, one side of the other one. So how come does it, the, this happens, right? So you know Charlie, what's the name of this? This is he appears in the Apocalypse Now, this uh, actor over here, but he is uh, the dad of Charlie Sheen. So I forgot uh, the name of this guy, but this last name Sheen too. Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen, yeah, thank you. So he appears in Apocalypse Now. If you haven't watched the movie, it's like kind of like freaky and I think Marlon Brando appears too and everything. So if you see like they look pretty alike, right? So you're like, how come they look really like similar and everything? And probably where is the mom? Like, I don't have a picture of uh, her, of his mom, but like he looks really, really, really like his dad, right? So you're like, oh, I wonder what it happens. Also, if you watch Game of Thrones, if somebody of you watched Game of Thrones before, you know, like the Targaryen family, they always have uh, white hair. I don't know if anyone over here has watched this uh, TV show on HBO, 
It is like if you have time to watch it or something, you shoot at the beginning like a hundred names, but after that, like you get a hold of everything. But you see, like these uh, uh, Eddie Sargarian has uh, white hair and she has white hair, and the descendants they have like white hair and the white hair and the white hair and the white hair, and you're like, this is going on. Something is going on with the traits of this family. But then if you go to the Stark family, you also see like they have brown hair, a brown hair, a brown hair, and brown hair. Well, she has red hair, but they're like brown hair, brown hair, brown hair. So you're like, oh, this is something going on over here with these traits. And also today we're gonna learn how to read these, um, these trees, this family tree, we're gonna learn how to read the pedigree. So we're gonna understand better these, but you're like, ah, this is something going on over here. Also when you see the genealogy of the Simpsons, and you see like March have very similar hair to Jackie. Uh, well, actually they actually pretty look alike. Herb and Homer Simpson, they look very alike to each other, except like he has hair and stuff like that. So you're like, oh, what are the probabilities of like Bart having this type of hair? But actually these two girls, Lisa and Maggie, they have the same exact type of hair. And then they, two, these two sisters, Patty and Selma, they have also the same hair. So you start seeing a pattern of like these traits even in cartoons and TV shows and everything and you turn around and then you see your family you, see, you have your siblings and you're like yeah you look more like your mom and like my mom or your dad my, my dad etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know you see many differences but also a lot of similarities between families so a little bit of vocabulary before we start everything over here so we're going to introduce some new words in, in order to understand better what we are studying today. So the first word we're gonna learn today is the word genetics. So since we are now talking about genetics and inheritance, we need to understand what is genetics. So genetics is just the study of genes. We're gonna see more in detail what is uh, the meaning of genes, which we already saw briefly before, but they're gonna study the genes and how they are expressed. So genetics is going to tell you, okay, so if gene is, um, section of DNA that is going to encode for a function or an RNA or a protein. So how these are going to be expressed? Are they going to be expressed because there are certain factors in the environment that are going to turn them on? Or are they like physical factors? Um, I said like environmental outside factors or what is happening with the genes, how they're going to be expressed. The other one is inheritance which is like how traits or characteristics are passed from generation to generation. So those ones who have children, now you can, um, after these exercises that you can play with the pedigree and the family trees and play with the probabilities and start playing with those ones. And even if you know the information from your parents and probably from your grandparents, then you can start even guessing more and more information about the probabilities of everything. Then chromosomes, which we spoke already before plenty in the previous uh, class, they are made out of uh, thousands of genes, each one of them. And chromosomes are going to be generally made out of uh, DNA, which is going to be wrapped around um, proteins called histones. So these ones are going to be like superstructures of DNA that are going to be formed during uh, cellular division in order to keep um, to, um, the DNA split evenly when mitosis or meiosis happens. And then genetic material. Genetic material, we are talking just in general genes and chromosomes or DNA or RNA that is usually found inside of the nucleus of a cell in eukaryotic cells. So these words are very important because later I'm gonna be talking about genetics. I'm gonna be talking about the inheritance. So when I select like the genetic material, so I'm talking either of these or these or these, all right? So a little bit more of detail of what is a gene. So a gene is just a region of DNA I use it and put the DNA over here, uh, that encodes for a functional RNA or a protein or a function. So this is just technically the, the real definition of a gene. I just put over here in red locus and plural loci. This refers on the location in which this gene is going to be on the specific chromosomes. 
So chromosomes are not going to be bouncing. Say, for example, you know humans, we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So on chromosome number one, we're going to have a very set specific um, um, number of genes. And these ones are going to be located usually in the same place in which they are always are in different humans. So say you get my chromosome number one, and then you take Adam chromosome number one, and you take Evelyn chromosome number one, and Bria chromosome number one, and then you check like this section of the chromosome, and you're going to find the same type of genes in this section of the chromosome. So imagine if we would be able, if everything was completely mixed, even more like more mixed than during meiosis, so we will be really unable to map all the human genome, the, the a work that has been done for over 30 years. So the genes are always getting repeated in the same locations called locus or, or plural loci, like this one over here. So again, a gene is just a region of DNA that is going to encode for a functional RNA, a function or a protein. So usually, is going to be a sequence. So you can have like A, T, 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 G, and all this, this uh, sequence of DNA. So from this point all the way to probably like say 1,000, 2,500, or 100,000 base pairs later, the gene is going to end. So this is like, that is going to be the piece of DNA that's gonna have a specific function, right? So gene is going to be the molecular unit of heredity. So we're going to pass the chromosomes from generation to generation, you know, like from our grandparents to us and from us to our children. But actually these functional sections are the ones that we're, we really are interested on during this class, okay? So think as a gene, or you think like this is a whole chromosome over here. All these pieces of the library is a whole chromosome, right? So every single book over here is going to be a gene. So say you are looking for um, cook, uh, like a cooking re uh, recipe book. So probably it's going to be uh, this book that is over here. So then you need to know how exactly make, uh, I don't know, filet mignon with a um, I don't know, with a um, mushroom sauce on the, uh, um, I don't know, like garlic bread. So then <clears throat> the cell is going to pull this book over here, is going to open it, and instead of like all the paragraphs and whatever it is over there, it's going to be a series of sequence of DNA, which is going to tell you, oh, preheat the, uh, the pan to 350 Fahrenheit, and then uh, put uh, 12 ounces of filet mignon once this is hot over there, and switch every three minutes from side to side of a filet mignon and blah, blah. So it's gonna tell you the whole recipe of everything. But also, if you need to know how to make pancakes, then in, in all these chromosomes, you're gonna put, pull a different book over here, and then you're gonna bring it over here. So it's gonna tell you, oh, get uh, water or milk, mix it with the flour and then add one or two eggs or something and then preheat the pan at 350 Fahrenheit. So it's gonna tell you all the uh, recipes of everything. So that's what technically are like, you have the whole chromosome and then inside of it, you have like this, all these books with the recipes of how to do everything that we need, okay? So examples of a gene, for example, is like the gene MCR1, which is the skin pigmentation. So you know, like we have different uh, skin pigmentation. So there is going to be different varieties of this gene in humans. So we are not only talking about only one specific, but a gene will have probably, probably a variety of different types. So we'll all see it later, but for example, like the types of gene that they uh, tell us what color of our eyes are going to be. So you see like some of you will have blue eyes and want to have like brown, dark eyes. Some others they have hazel, some others they have green, some others they have like gray eyes. So a gene is going to be just a general, 
but inside of the gene, we have like varieties of this gene that are going to encode for the same function, which is the color, for example, of the eyes or the skin pigmentation. But then inside of this one, we're gonna have like a series of varieties of the gene, all right? Another examples of gene are BRCA1, which is uh, the breast cancer type one. So like for people who have this gene, they have a high chance to develop breast cancer, for example. And then the other genes like MYH6, which is related to muscles and how they move. And then you can go to the list of chromosomes in Wikipedia and you're gonna find that we have actually thousands and thousands of genes over there listed, all right? So we spoke of, uh, about it before. So in humans, we have a total of 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. And they are in pairs because one is coming from mom, one is coming from dad. And the same for every single one, all of them, one on one. So 50% each one of them, right? So if you Google how many genes do we have as humans, the number is going to change between 19 to 22, some others. So like maybe there are 30,000 genes, but we haven't discovered all of them. But up to now, we have discovered that we have around 19 to 20,000 protein encoding genes. Not all of them are going to express. Some of them are going to be just there waiting for the right moment to express. Or some of them, for example, like the breast cancer type one uh, gene um, that I just recently mentioned. Hopefully that one will never going to be expressed. But we have, if you see the number, is really astonishing the number of genes that we have in our bodies. So there is this program called the Human Genome um, Research Project. And I'm gonna show um, my website over here. So if you go to the Human Genome website over here, then you're gonna start learning more about, more about genetics and how they are, um, how they are like read and how the project has been established since I think the Clinton administration in the 1990s and everything. So they can share all the sequences of DNAs that they have been doing. So the purpose of this um, human genome research. So the idea is like we have to map all the genome of humans. So we are like taking samples from a lot of humans here and there and people that are sick, people that are not sick and trying to make the differences, trying to understand which genes are related to breast cancer, which genes are the good ones, etc., etc. So that's a really important research that has been funded for over 30 years or something like that. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation over here. So, as I was mentioning before, not all of them are going to express. Not all of them say we have 19 to 20,000. There are going to be probably a couple thousands that are not going to be expressed. So that's why it leads us to the next topic, which is gene expression. So, you know, the appearance or, or, of a characteristic or effect attributed to a gene of a group, this can be translated into a cell function or a trait. So uh, the genes are, uh, well, I have a question over here, how this is determined. It is determined there are multiple factors coming from what mix of genes you're going to obtain from the combination of the gametes from mom and dad, all the way to something called epigenetics. And I'm, I think we discussed already what, are, what is epigenetics, right, in the discussion, which is like environmental factors that are um, turning on and off the genes that we have. So say, for example, like in the case of many uh, microorganisms, the presence of heat is going to uh, make some sections of the DNA are going to or, um, turn on, some genes are going to turn on, and then the bacteria is going to move from one vegetative step, which is just a regular, um, cell to something called the endospore, which is going to create a like, really thick cell wall around it. So it's going to protect it against heat. So then when the heat reduces, then these genes are going to be turned off and then the cell is going to go back into its normal stage. So there is, uh, there are a lot of uh, factors that determine how the genes are going to get expressed. 
So, you know, some of genes are going to be expressed more than the other ones. And that's why this human genome research is trying to understand how these genes are getting expressed and how we can control that. So I think one of, you, one of the groups over here, you have a really CRISPR technologies. So CRISPR te technologies is heavily related to gene expression because then we, once we understand how these genes are, can be activated or, or deactivated, you can even edit those genes and then you can remove them or you can replace by another ones, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's like really important to understand, okay? So when we are talking and I've been talking about uh, traits and like blue eyes, brown eyes, skin color, hair color and everything, we actually have some scientific definitions in how we can group all of those things into one single word. So we're gonna have in general two different words. The first one, I'm gonna mention the, uh, the one at the bottom of here. The first word that we need to learn today is going to be the phenotype. So the phenotype is just going to be the set of all observable characteristics of an organism and is going to be the result of interactions of phenotype and environment. So phenotype can be translated into anything that will be translated into something that we can see. Even for microorganisms, say we cannot see microorganisms, but when we get close under the microscope, we are going to see some set of characteristics like the shape, the type of cell wall, the type of locomotion, um, antibiotic resistance, and the type of enzymes or the type of toxins, and the color of the eyes, the skin color, the shape of our ears, the shape of the nose, and all those characteristics, the physical characteristics that we can see and measure are going to be called the phenotype. So if you wanna be like, say, if you, can, if you have a crush on somebody and you can tell him, oh, you have, a, you have a, real, a real nice phenotype. And they'll be like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And they're gonna be like, that guy or that girl is crazy because what the hell is phenotype? But you're talking about all the you know, all the structure of that person, right? So you, you can tell your wife or your husband too, uh, like, I like your phenotype. So they'll be like, well, thank you. I don't know what you mean, but thank you. Or if they know, they'll understand that you're talking about all the physical characteristics of the individual. On the other side, these phenotype are going to be regulated by something called genotype. So genotype is just the genetic constitution of an organism. So it's just technically the sequence of the DNA is going to be the genotype. So since I was mentioning before that some genes are going to be expressed or not, we can say like genotype and phenotype are not going to be the same. So remember, I was telling you like some uh, spores with the heat, I mean, some bacteria with the heat are going to um, go into something called endospores. So this phenotype of endospore is going to be activated by some specific type of genotype, which is going to be latent over here, but it's not going to be expressed until the circumstances are right for that condition to appear. So genotype is just, again, technically uh, the sequence of DNA or the genetic constitution of an individual, the chromosomes, the genes, or the whole genome of an organism. And the phenotype is just the uh, observable characteristics of that organism. So probably sometimes, as I was mentioning before, humans might have 19 to 20,000 genes, which are going to be part of a genotype but actually only 15,000 of them are going to be expressed into something called the phenotype, which is the uh, observable characteristic. Then the other four or 5,000 are not going to be part of the phenotype, but they will be part of the genotype. That makes sense? Yeah. So stop me if you need like clarification or something, don't worry, I can stop and then we can review it again, okay? 
So let's go back a little bit in history and let's review how do we get to know all of this information. So we're going to rewind our cassettes, not even cassettes, not the diskettes, even before the invention of electricity, and then we're going to jump back in time a long time. So I'm going to introduce to you to this guy, Gregor Mendel, so for those ones who um, haven't heard about Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel is, um, um, he was a monk, actually. He was an Austrian monk that uh, he lived back in the mid of the 1800s. And since he had a lot of time free studying, you know, like uh, religious uh, uh, theory, but also, you know, like a church had, had a lot of um, uh, time to run some experiments back then with some guys like him, he was experimenting with pea plants. And then he was using pea plants because pea plants were really available back in uh, those years. They have like really big gardens in which he could work his experiments. Uh, the pea plants, they uh, reproduce very quick. Um, they show obvious differences in the traits or the phenotype. These traits are AKA phenotypes. So say some of them were going to have purple flowers. Some of them were going to have white flowers. So completely different. Some of them were going to have green fruits. The other ones were going to have yellow fruits. So the characteristics that he was seeing between these uh, plants were really obvious and they were really the opposite of each other. So he was trying to work with those characteristics, traits, or phenotypes. So his mind was wandering a lot. Probably his mind was like 100 years after his time. So he had some free time. I was like, well, you know, I'm going to start applying the scientific method in order to understand why this is happening. Like when I'm, I'm mating or breeding some different uh, types of pea plant, I get these results, this type of flowers or this type of fruits. And I want to understand how this process happens, right? So he understood that um, there was a, something called the factor, something that over here that's called the factor that was carrying these traits from one generation to the next one because he was like, I'm mating or breeding purple flowers with purple flowers and then I'm going to get purple flowers. But if I get purple flowers and white flowers and then I'm going to get everything is purple, so he was like, where the white flowers went? Like, what happened over here? Like, I want to understand what is going on. And he was like, there is something called the factor that is actually passing from generation to generation, but I know, I want to know what it is. So this is more pictures of Gregor Mendel about the mid 1800s. And at the same time that he was working with his experiments, um, at the same time, on another side, another island called England, um, Charles Darwin was working and developing his uh, theory of evolution by the means of natural selection. But there was a shame that Mender, Mendel and Darwin never spoke with each other because if they could understand the work of each other, then probably all the theory of evolution would be probably like a century ahead of time. But it wasn't until the late 1800s, early 1900s, in which we rediscovered the work of Mendel. And then people noticed that we could explain how uh, the ideas of Darwin could be explained with these factors and this work of Gregor Mendel. So his experiments, you see a picture over here. He took a long time because he was working, um, doing hand pollination. So if you have worked in the garden before, hand pollination means like you have to go to the flower and then with a tweezer or something, you have to take the stamen and the pollen and then you have to move it and transfer it by hand to another flower. And then you have to like, technique is like artificial insemination for flowers. And these are really, really lengthy and like um, um, it implies a lot of work. So he worked about like seven years doing these experiments. And he was, as I was mentioned before, the first one to apply an uh, experimental approach for the questions of inheritance. So he was working based on the scientific method. So he had a hypothesis in which he was saying like, well, parents, they pass onto their offspring separate and distinct factors that now we call genes. Now we know like these factors are going to be genes. 
and these Gs are going to be the responsibles for inherited traits. So technically, what he was saying, like we have genes, and we are passing these genes from generation to generation, and these genes are the ones that are going to be expressed, and that's why our children, they have this specific uh, like phenotype, these specific uh, traits over there. So that was, that was his hypothesis. So how he was doing this experiment. So and this is uh, already something repeated from the another slide over here that he was working with peas because they were really easy to uh, to grow. The characteristics were really the opposite. You see the color of the flowers and the type of seed also was like either green or either yellow or wrinkled or smooth. So he was working with these characteristics. But he, what he was doing, um, as I was telling over here, he was cutting these uh, to prevent cell fertilization. And then with a brush, he was like doing some pollen transfer from one flower to the next one. And then after this, he was waiting to see what was happening into the next generation of the next plants, all right? So he was like really working really hard on this. So in order to test his hypothesis, Mendel was crossing uh, true breeding plants, true breeding, that means like this purple was coming from another purple that was coming from another purple that was coming from another purple. So, you know, like that's when um, people like to buy like pure breed uh, dogs. So they like that they're coming from a German shepherd that is coming from a German shepherd that is coming from another German shepherd or a chihuahua from a chihuahua from a chihuahua so that you know that it's actually a true breed. So that's why he was uh, working with these ones, the same uh, with these white flowers from the white one, from a white one, from a white one, from a white one. So he was working on this. So that's why it, it that's the meaning of the true breeding over here. So, you know, he was working thousands of thousands of flowers like this, like he was doing all these brushing pollinization by hand. So that's what I'm saying, it took a long time and about seven years um, of experiment. So something that he noticed is that uh, when he was mixing the P generation, the P will stand for parental generation, which is the very first generation. He was having true breeds of purple flowers and then true breeds of white flowers. And then the very first generation F, we all show you later, stands for filial in uh, Latin and also like in, uh, which means son in English and filio in, in, in say, in, in Italian. But then he was noticing that 100% of the next generation was going to be uh, purple. So he was like, okay, what happened with the, with the white one? I was expecting to see some white ones over here, but he didn't see anything. So he was like, okay, let me get another from the same generation and then let me breed it again. So he was just letting them breed by, by themselves. Like he wasn't self, uh, he wasn't pollinating by hand, but he was just like, let it grow and see what happens. And then on the second generation, the filial two generation, he noticed that actually 75% of flowers were going to be purple and 25% of or one quarter was going to be white flowers. So he was like, hey, wait a moment. Like we didn't have white flowers over here, but then it seems like they skip a whole generation and they, they reappear later. So he was like, let me see what is going on because this doesn't make sense. So we're gonna work on that later and just keep it this in mind that this color, for example, the white flowers skipped one generation because we don't understand it later when we are working with probabilities. So again, the same experiment, the P generation is a parental generation, the F1 generation is the first filial generation for the, for the Latin word filial that means son, and then the F2 generation means the filial 2 generation. So let's try to keep in mind when I'm telling you the F1 or the F2. So say if I'm speaking about the F2, that means they are the grandchildren of the P generation. The F1 generation are going to be the direct child or children of the P generation over here. So again, and like just try to keep in mind this, where he was mixing purple and white true breeding flowers, he was getting 100% 
purple flowers on the F1 generation. But then when they were like uh, self-pollinating, then he was getting 25% of them white and 75% um, of them uh, purple. So he was amazed with these facts, like the white flowers were showing up later. So the idea is like he didn't only worked on color of flower, but also he was working on the flower position, which is axial or terminal. Axial means like it's in the middle of the plant or at the end of the plant. He was working with the seed color, either yellow or green. He was working with the seed shape, either round or wrinkled, the pot shape inflated or constricted, the pot color green or yellow, the stem length, which is tall or dwarf. So you see he was working in a lot of traits at the same time and trying to make sense of what, of what was going on. So these are some of his results over here. So for all the combinations that he was having for all these traits or phenotypes, remember phenotype because these are observable, observable characteristics. So he obtained these numbers over here. So if you convert these numbers into percentage, you're going to notice that actually they're going to be almost 75% of one and 25% of the other one. Almost, oh, oops, that's a two five. So almost the ratio is going to be to three to one. So when you see the ratio over here, 3.15 to 1, 3.14 to 1, 3.01 to 1, 2.96 to 1. All of them are almost 3 to 1, right? So then he was like, yeah, so these statistics are showing a pattern over here that I need to understand what is going on. So he left his work over there. Like he published everything, but nobody really cared too much back then. And they were like, you know, like you're a monk, an Austrian monk, so thank you for your work. That's it. So everything got forgotten for about 50 years until years later, uh, end of 1800s, early 1900s. Scientists, they discovered his work and they made sense of what happened. So what happened after his discovery? we created something called the Mendelian genetics. So the Mendelian genetics is just a group of laws and statements that make sense in how the traits are passed from generation to generation. And that's where I'm going to start throwing more vocabulary of the discoveries that we made. So in general, uh, there are three uh, laws in Mendelian genetics, which are these ones over here. The first one is going to be something called the independent assortment. So if you remember when we were uh, working on meiosis, meiosis one, specifically on metaphase one, when all the chromosomes are going to line up in the middle of the cell, there is going to be an event called the independent assortment in which it doesn't matter if it is from the chromosomes from mom or dad, it doesn't matter in which order they're going to be uh, lined up, they're going just to be lined up independently and randomly right in the middle of the cell. So this is going to ensure that there is going to be generic variety and diversity during meiosis. The second one is something called the law of dominance so he, Mendel was saying like they are dominant and recessive phenotypes or traits. Remember with the purple flowers and the white ones, it was really clear for Mendel and the people that discovered the work of Mendel later that the purple ones were dominant over the white color flowers, right? So also, I don't know if you heard, for example, in the case of humans, they say like brown eyes, are going to be dominant over the rest of the eye colors. So um, whoever has brown eyes, um, then you have children, somebody with blue or green eyes or any other type of color, then there is a higher chance that uh, the brown eyes is going to be the dominant over the other trait. So we'll see about dominant and the other type of uh, traits, okay? 
And then the last one, um, I'm, I'm uh, used most to apologize. I added this slide uh, very last minute because I wanted used to write it down over here. The last law um, is going to be called the law of segregation. And what it means in the law of segregation is like each one of us are going to have two versions of the same gene or the same, um, the same characteristic. And then they're going to segregate randomly when we are going through meiosis. So when we refer to law segregation, it's like we're going to have one gene from mom and the other one from dad, you know, and then at the end, they're going to segregate during meiosis. One is going to go to one uh, gamete and the other one is going to go to the other gamete. So that's the law of segregation, all right? So now I want to get more into the law, the second law, which is the law of dominance, and then keep giving you a little bit more information of the law of dominance. So as I was telling you, some traits are going to be dominant over other ones. So they are going to be dominant traits, which are the traits that are going to be expressed as I was telling you, one of the examples is like the brown eyes are going to be dominant over the rest of eye color. And for example, also if you have, um, I don't know, I'm thinking a rabbit with brown fur and a rabbit with white fur, usually the brown fur is going to be dominant over the other one. So the other dominant, I mean, I'm sorry, the other trait is going to be called recessive trait. So the dominant trait is going to be the one that is going to be expressed and the recessive trait is going to be the one that is going to be covered up. So say for example, I have brown eyes. So I have brown eyes over here, which is this one over here. But then say, for example, like my wife has blue eyes, so she's going to have blue eyes over here. But I was telling you the fact that uh, the dominant trait is going to be the one that is going to be expressed. So my gametes most likely are going to be having the dominant trait. And then my wife is going to be providing this type of trait, which is, say, for example, blue eyes. So when then I'm going to mix both of them into Alicia Conde, which that's going to be the name of a daughter, then the dominant trait for the eye color is going to be the one that is going to be dominant and is the one that is going to be expressed. So at the end, she's going to be something like this, like it's going to have one section of me and one section of my wife, but at the end together, what really the one that is going to be expressed is going to be the brown coloration over here. So that's what it means when something is dominant and something is recessive. And keep this in mind, it is very important because we'll be working in some exercises later. And then it is very important to know in those exercises, what is dominant and what is recessive, because based on that information, you're gonna be able to know and determine the percentages or the ratios of phenotypes at the end, all right? Just let me know if uh, we need to review all that information so I can stop and we can redo it again, okay? So then, as you can see over here, when I was mentioning that actually we have, you know, we have, uh, we have brown eyes, we have blue eyes, we have hazel eyes, we have green eyes, we have uh, gray eyes, and sometimes we have like this type of eyes that change color depending on the mood or the light so in which the person is, like it's just different colors and everything. So you see between the gene, that encodes the type of color of eye, we are going to have a variety or types of genes that are going to give, uh, it's gonna have the specific function, but it's going to be a different variety. 
So say the gene for encoding eye color could be either blue or could be either green or could be either brown or could be either black or could be either gray or could be either hazel. So all these varieties that a gene is going to adopt is going to be called an allele. So let's review an allele over here uh, in the next slide. And usually all these alleles are going to come in pairs because one is going to be given by the dad, like this one over here, and another one is going to be given by the mom. So that's why usually the alleles are going to be coming in pairs. So just note over here that instead of me speaking about a gene, I'm going to be switch my word allele, uh, the, the word gene to allele. So allele is going to be just the variety of that a gene can adopt, right? Does that make sense to you or not? Kind of, more or less. Somebody wants to tell me or just uh, just put your thumbs up or thumbs down or something. I will appreciate it. So it's a feedback over here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, as I was mentioning over here, and I have a whole slide for alleles, the alleles are going to be, as I was saying, the alternative versions of a gene. So we can have either for, even with the shape of the hair. So we have a, um, my dog is place over here. So for example, we're gonna have uh, curly hair. So we have the gene that is going to code for the shape of the hair. So we have curly hair, then we have uh, wavy hair, then we have straight hair, and then we have other types of hair, like kind of an intermediate hair, and mixes of hair, et cetera, et cetera. So all of them are going to be just versions of, this, the, of the same gene, all right? The same with the color of the skin or the color of the fur of an animal. So say in humans, we have different type of in color, which actually is just going to be a different version of a gene. So that's why when people are talking about, um, you know, they have racist slurs and everything, I'm like, hey, what the hell? It, it is just one single change in an allele over 20,000 different genes that we have in the humans and then still people there to have these like, you know, like bad words against uh, different types of people, et cetera, et cetera, just because of variety of a gene, which is going to be an allele. So that biologically makes no sense, you know, that I'm speaking about racism and everything like biologically doesn't make sense because at the end it's just an alternative version of what everyone has. So that's why I'm saying like racism is just like, if you forgive me the words, just bullshit and everything, because at the end, like we all have the same type of genes, but just different uh, or alternative versions, which are called alleles, okay? So say in the case of Mendel exercise that we were, we were talking about purple and white flowers, so we are going to have in this specific locus or the location in which the gene is going to be located, we have this specific allele for um, white, for purple flowers, and then we will have on another, another variety of the same gene, which is going to encode for white flowers. So um, I hope this is, this is uh, clear enough, but if not, you can just let me know so we can review it again. So now when I'm talking about genes, uh, when I'm talking, I'm sorry, when I'm talking about alleles, are going to be talking about genes that they are just a different versions of the same gene, okay? So we'll see it during more exercises later and we're gonna understand like more about this. So the uh, alleles are going to differ and that's going to go back to what I was trying to explain before with the law of dominance in which we are going to have certain type of dominant alleles and some certain types of recessive alleles. 
So in my in trying to understand which one is dominant and recessive in our bodies, even if we have 19 to 20,000 different types of uh, genes in our bodies. So that's something like, it's like at this point, it's like we might need uh, three, five PhDs in order to understand how this is working or billions of dollars like the government is spending in the human genome research in order to understand all this. But something that is fact is like we are going to have alleles that are dominant, the ones that are going to get expressed. And usually when we are writing them down, um, these alleles are going to be depicted by a capital letter, like A, B, C, D, or an L, like a capital L, a capital E, a capital G, a capital H, you name it, a capital Z, but it oh, this mouse is going crazy, a capital Z, you name it, but they have to be depicted as capital letters. So every time you're working with genetics and you are referring to dominant allele, that means that this is going to be in capital. Then recessive is the ones that are going to be, uh, are going to be, you know, like blocked to be expressed by the dominant um, allele except when you are receiving two recessive alleles from, your, from both of your parents. So say, if you are getting the, this is your parent, with the blue eyes, and then your mother with the blue eyes, and then when you have them together, then, oh, this is an A, sorry, I don't know why the mouse keeps doing this, but they are gonna have two recessive together, which are exactly the same, so when two recessives are together and are the same, they will actually are going to express to the blue eye color. But say if you have the, uh, somebody that is brown eyes, which is dominant over blue eyes, which is over here, and then when you combine them together, then actually the, um, dominant allele is going to block this from expression. So then the person is going to look with the phenotype of brown eye. So that's why the recessives are going to be expressed only when they are paired with the same variety of allele. And they will be depicted with a lower cases all the time. So dominant are going to be capital letters, and recessives are going to be lowercase letters. So as you notice over here, like this is a gamut A and this is gamut B or gamut one and gamut two. So when they get together, I'm putting the two letters together. So one A, another A. So you combine it, it's going to be A and A. So when I mix B over here and I'm just gonna make it like even like lowercase B, so when I mix them together in a diploid organism are going to be capital B and lowercase b. So this is very important to understand like when we are working with genetics, like diploid organisms, they're going to contain like the letter from one parent and the letter from the other one, okay? So that's gonna lead me to the next explanation which is going to be called something the homozygous and heterozygous. So when two, when an organism has alleles, uh, has two of the same alleles, is going to be called homozygous. So homo means the same, and zygous is coming from the word zygote. When you mix the gametes together, they, they have, after fertilization process, they have a zygote. So when these um, alleles, alleles are going to be the same, they are going to be called homozygous. So they can be either homozygous dominant, like these ones, because everything is capital letters over here, or they can be homozygous recessive in the case that they are lowercase a a, lowercase x x, or lowercase y y. So every time we are talking about uh, homozygous again, is going to be two of the same alleles together. So either capital dominant or lowercase recessive. And then 
we have the other type of organisms which are going to be heterozygotes, which are going to have one dominant and one recessive. One dominant and one recessive, or one dominant or recessive all the time. Hetero means different. So I know for a fact, for example, that uh, my dad is a heterozygous for uh, the eye color because um, I have uh, um, I have a half brother that actually he has blue eyes. So I know that my dad needed to donate like one recessive gene for this one. So I know that say, for example, my dad is a heterozygous for the eye coloration. So then there are other words over here like probability, which is the chances to get something or something that will occur. And we will learn after the break, what time is it? It's seven and one. Okay, so there are going to be a series of, um, of mathematical procedures that we do called the Punnett squares, which are going to show how crosses between currents are going to be made in order to get the probabilities for phenotypes and genotypes. So, you know, heterozygotes, because they are different, you see, like they are black and white. So don't forget about the side goats and don't try to forget this picture because they're half and half. So again, just let me move to the next one. Let's just ignore this slide because they are repetitive. repetitive. Um, but there are going to be some variations between dominant and recessive that I was explaining you. Remember that I was telling you a uh, brown in eye coloration is going to be dominant over blue eyes or type A blood is going to be dominant over type O blood. So if you have, for example, like O blood, if you know already your type blood, you are probably going to be homozygous for the, for O, so you're going to be probably O, O. Then uh, if you are um, A or B type blood, probably you can be either A, A, uh, homozygous dominant, or A, O, which is going to be, um, the A is going to be expressed and is going to be dominant over the type blood O. So there, is, there, there are going to be some variations in these patterns of inheritance. And there is something called the incomplete dominance. So you think that you are going to reach an average between the colors of the, or the traits of something. So say, for example, in incomplete dominance, you're going to have heterozygotes that have a phenotype that is going to be in between the phenotypes of the two homozygotes. So say for example, um, this one, you're gonna have a black chicken over here and then a white chicken over here. And then you are going to obtain a gray uh, chicken or they call the blue chickens because this is going to be a mix between both of them. Or if you have a flower that is going to be red and then you have a flower that is going to be white and then the F1 generation, the next generation is going to be pink because it's going to be an average between uh, them. So it's going to be called incomplete dominance. So this is going to be very important for not this exam that is coming from, but for the next exam, this is going to be very valuable information that you need to remember because of the examples or the exercises that we will work even for Wednesday laboratory. There are some that they say like, the something something explains and then they say like this trait presents incomplete dominance. So then you know, oh, okay, incomplete dominance means an average between these two organisms. And on the other side, we have something called the codominance. So is something like when you uh, have a black uh, chicken and a white chicken, you're gonna get a checkered chicken. So it's going to show the phenotypes not mixed between them. So the same example for the red or the pink flower, with the white flowers, you're going to get mix of them. So you see like the white over here doesn't really mix with the other coloration over here. The same with the huskies. So you know like the huskies are going to have like a blue eye and a brown eye. And there are people that actually, they present the same pattern of eye coloration. And I had a student um, like two years ago 
that actually she had a blue eye and a brown eye. So she was like the perfect, perfect example of co-dominance. So that means that they both, the both phenotypes are going to coexist on the phenotype. It's not an average, it's just like both of them are going to show. All right, so how do we know these probabilities? How do we know all, how do we wrap up all this, this information that we've been learning right now? So there is something called the Punnett squares, which are going to help us to determine the probabilities of the phenotypes on the genotypes. So as it says over here, a uh, Punnett square is going to be a diagram that is going to show the probabilities of the possible outcome of a genetic cross. So it's going to be very simple. The ones that we are going to learn for this class are going to be very simple because this is going to be for only one uh, trait. So imagine when we are having children, this square, instead of having only four squares inside, you have to put 19,000 genes in one side and 19,000 genes on the other side, and then you have to do all the mixes over there. So that's what happens during fertilization. So how they are going to work, what's gonna happen when you are making, let me see, yeah, I have this slide over here. So when we are doing the Punnett squares, we are going to put on one side at the top, the genetic contribution of one parent, and then on the other side, the vertical over here, are going, we are going to put the genetic contribution of the other parent. And then we are going to make a um, series of combinations, uh, multiplication between these two different uh, arrows over here. So say this one with this one, and then this one with this one. And then in the next one, we're gonna get this one, with this one and then this one with this one. So we're going to work on these exercises to understand better how we do it. But for now, if you want, we can take a break. Um, it is 7.08, so we can take a break from now all the way to 7.20 and then we are going to come back to understand and wrap up how we know, how we under, under, how we know all these probabilities and phenotypes, okay? So if you have any questions, you can seek around or you can ask me after the break, all right? Okay, so let's take 12 minutes of break.
All right, everyone, so it's already 7.20. So if you can just turn on your cameras to know that you're still there or thumbs up or something like that. Some people are in an aquarium. I see that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so we are now just half of the class, but still, let's continue with the presentation and see some uh, examples of how can we measure the probabilities of the point squares and phenotypes and genotypes, all right? So again, so remember, we are, so let me put my pointer over here. Remember, we are diploid organisms, right? So we are going to contain uh, two types of uh, two chromosomes, one from mom, and one from dad, right? So by the time that we are dividing into gametes, then we are going to split these chromosomes or these alleles into separate ones. So we're going to have one single A, for example, in this one, and another single, I don't know why this keeps making these lines over here, and another single A over here. So we're gonna split our gametes into haploids over here. So when we are working on Punnett squares, so let's make a square, kind of a square over here. So in one side, on the upper side, we are going again to have the genetic contribution of one parent, that is that is the alleles of the parent. Say so you can say like if that was a heterozygous dominant, one of them is going to be capital A, capital A. And then if the other one is going to be homozygous recessive, when I'm speaking about homozygous, homo means the same and recessive means lower cases. So that means that the other person will be lowercase a, lowercase a, right? So then in the Punnett square, we are going to have lowercase a and lowercase a. So then we have to match in every single square that we have over here. Each one of them is going to represent 25% of a probability because 20, 5, 50, 75, 100%. So this is like the 100% of the chances that something will happen. So what we do over here is just like the combinations of the gametes of the, this parent with the, these ones in each one of the squares, and let's see what we can obtain. So then we're gonna mix this one with this one. So we are going to have a capital A with a lowercase a. So this means that we have a heterozygous organism in the first 25% of chances. Then this lowercase a is going to be having the probabilities of mating with another one capital A from the other parent, which is going to be, I don't know why these straight lines are happening over here, with lowercase. So that means that there is another 25% chances of another heterozygous. And now we have to go to the lower part and then we repeat the same procedure. This, with this one, then we are going to obtain another heterozygous. And then for the last square, we are going to, to get this one by this one over here. So then at the end, you'll see that usually when we are breeding one homozygous dominant with another homozygous recessive, the 100% of the F1 of the, this generation is going to be heterozygous for this trait. So that's how we do, for example, an experiment like this one. So we have to measure and we have to divide the contribution of one parent on the top, and then the contribution of another father of another parent on the side, and then we do the combinations inside of our Punnett square. So for this one, then we can say that there is a hundred percent probabilities 
that this generation is going to be heterozygous. So the genotype is going to be heterozygous and say, for example, A is going to be for red, for example, like a red color of something. And then lowercase a, oh, this is an a, is going to be for blue. So that means that in the phenotype, if we have this dominant red over here, that means that this one is going to be expressed over the recessive uh, allele, which is going to be depicted as a lowercase. And then we will see that 100% of this F1 generation is going to be red, okay? So let's make an experiment that Mendel was doing in order to understand what happened over there. So again, father genes one side, mother genes on the other side, or vice versa, mother genes over here, and father genes over here. And then we get the combinations like this. Again, so it's a series of combinations like this one, and this with this, this with this, and then A with this one, and this with this one over here. Just before we go to the Mendel experiment, you know, we have a homozygous recessive for blue eyes, and then we have a homozygous dominant for brown eyes. So when we make the Punnett square, if it is a homozygous recessive, that means that it's going to contain two lowercase b. And then we have a homozygous dominant for brown. So that means that it's going to have a capital letter B. So don't worry for uh, the experiments that we will do and the questions. We have, when I have to give you that information that somebody is homozygous or somebody is a heterozygous dominant, or I can tell you the blue eyes is um, recessive. And if somebody has um, blue eyes, then you immediately can think that this person is recessive for that gene. And don't worry, when I'm speaking about recessive, that doesn't mean that it's bad or there is something wrong over there. Not at all. Zero ideas of that. Please don't think like that. It is just that there is another gene that is going to be dominant over that specific phenotype. Okay? So when you have this, put the square over here and then you divide and then you are. Um, having this Punnett square, then you'll see like for every single combination over here, you are going to obtain that 100% of the offspring of these people are going to have brown eyes, right? So I'm asking you, uh, what would be the probability of these children of being homozygous recessive. That means that they will have blue eyes. Anyone can tell me or just put it in the chat. What are the probabilities of this offspring of having blue eyes? Zero percent. Zero percent. Yeah, exactly. And somebody else was in, this in the chat over here. And Evelyn, yeah, thank you, Evelyn. He's saying also zero percent. You see the brown is dominant. So that's why even if this generation has um blue eyes over here but there's uh, the brown overcoming and expressing over the blue eyes the same with this one you see a little bit more of differences this is the first one that i was showing you but this is different you have somebody that is um, homozygous recessive for blue eyes and then you are um um, they're going to have children with somebody that is heterozygous for brown eyes. Heterozygous, that means that we'll have one allele from one and the other one is going to be uh, different, so dominant and the recessive. So then you have to separate those alleles and then you have blue eyes on top and the brown eyes on the side. And then you make your corresponding uh, mixes over here and then you mix both of them over here. And then I can ask you now, based oops, based on this, just give me one second, my computer is, uh, the screen is moving a little bit. 
Give me a second. Um, all right. Can you see my screen over there? Yeah, okay, thank you. So now when we see this, I am asking you, what are the probabilities of these children having blue eyes? 50%. 50%, exactly. So each square represents 25%. We have two of them, 50%. And now I ask you from a standpoint of a genotype, what are the chances of uh, the children or the offspring of being uh, homozygous recessive. So recessive is the lower cases, right? Everything is lower cases. If I am asking you, homozygous recessive, fifty percent is going to be exactly fifty percent. So homozygous recessive are going to be depicted by two lower cases. And you see these two guys at the bottom are going to be recessive. What are the probabilities in this one square of having a uh, homozygous dominant? Homozygous dominant is going to mean two of these guys like this. What are the probabilities based on our results? Do, do you see any capital B, capital B on this one over here? No. Uh -huh. so zero. Zero, yeah, exactly. And Evelyn went ahead and also said 0%. So the chances that we have a homozygous dominant is going to be zero because we don't have anything like that over here. And now what are the chances of having heterozygous? Heterozygous are these ones over here. What are the, say again? 50%. 50%, exactly, because these are the other leftovers that we have over here that are going to be 50%. So um, do you follow me over here, everyone? Do you know what we're doing over here? It's just a matter of uh, combinations like this one over here. So if not, then let's work on some exercises over here. And that's what Mendel was doing. So Mendel was having pure breeds, remember? Like the pure breeds that he knew that was coming from purple, from purple, from purple, from purple, and then white flowers, from white flowers, from white flowers, from white flowers. So he was doing, it's like he wanted to see the F1 generation, what were the probabilities of having either white flowers or purple flowers. So then, oh, this is our square over here. So first we are going to draw our square. And then later we are going to put, no matter where, but this is the capital P over here. And this is the lowercase p. So this capital P, these two ones over here are going to represent the purple flowers over here. And these ones over here are going to represent the white flowers over here, okay? So if we start making our Punnett square, we have the capital P with lowercase, which is this one by this one. And then this one by this one is going to be the same, oops. Give me one second, my computer keeps, uh, I don't know what my computer is doing over here. I'm gonna stop sharing and reshare again. I'm sorry. Okay. And then for the next one, for the lower level over here, we are going to have also this P capital with this lowercase p over here. And then the same for this one. P capital coming from this one, and then this one multiplied by this one, then we keep it over here. So then, if you notice on these results, we are going to obtain, what, what will be the percentage of heterozygous uh, over here? The genotype heterozygous, what will be the percentage? Zero. Um, um, would be, like the other way. So say this is a capital P lowercase. 
this is a capital P and a lowercase. Capital P, lowercase, this, which means this is a heterozygous, right? Oh. This is another heterozygous. Hetero means different. And then we have another heterozygous over here. And then we have another heterozygous over here. So then, in total, the actual real probability, and also Evelyn was writing the, the right answer over here, is going to be that 100% of organisms are going to be heterozygous. So that means that we don't have any homozygous dominant, which will be a capital P, capital P, and we don't have any homozygous lower uh, um, homozygous recessive with our lowercase p, lowercase p. All right. So you follow me over here. So what Mendel was doing is like he was then okay. I'm gonna grab these heterozygous from this generation, and I'm going to let them self uh, fertilize with another heterozygous from the same generation. So what he was doing is like he was, instead of multiplying this by this, he was getting actually one heterozygous by another heterozygous, right? So then if we make the Punnett square for, uh, for this one, actually I'm going to buy for next week a uh, pad so I can draw it better. Then we're going to have uh, heterozygous parent over here and another heterozygous parent over here. Okay, I don't know why this keeps doing this. So then we have one capital P multiplied by another capital P. So we have already 25% chances of getting a homozygous dominant, right? This one's over here. And then we have a capital P over here multiplied by a lowercase p. So now we have 25% of a heterozygous. And then we have another capital. This is a capital P over here by this one, lowercase. So we have another 25% of a heterozygous. So we have 25 plus 25. And then we have a lowercase p with another lowercase p. Okay, so let's review the genotypes of this one. For homozygous dominant, which is capital P, capital P, what would be the percentage of this? 25. 25, exactly. So we have 25, so I'm not gonna use it. I'm not gonna use, yes, Christine is saying 25, that is correct. For homozygous, recessive how what is the percentage that we would expect to see 25 25 yeah so exactly we're getting another 25 percent over there and for heterozygous uh, 50. yeah 50 percent are these two guys here 50 25 and 25 okay so those are genotypes when I'm speaking about phenotypes now, you tell me the color percentage for each one of them. So for purple, what would be the percentage in purple if the purple is dominant? Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was very good. Very good. So let's see, Evelyn is saying 75%. 75. 75% is going to be purple, right? And 25% is going to be white, right? Because even these heterozygous, even if they have this homo, uh, this recessive over here, but these P low, uh, um, yeah, this P, uh, capital P is going to overcome this one. And then this percentage is going to turn purple. So you have 25% purple phenotype. 50% purple because heterozygous are going to show the dominant trait, which is purple. And then we have pure purple. So 25 plus 25 plus 25 is going to give you 75 purple. And again, like if we are going to see now 
25% of white flowers appearing until the second generation. So if you convert this in ratio, then we are going to have like every, for every four plants, three are going to be uh, purple and one is going to be white. So if you go back and let me just go back all the way to this over here, when you see the flowers over here, the ratio that Mendel was getting was almost exactly as the theoretical um, results that we could have with this Punnett square. So it's almost going to be three to one. So he was just working with a thousand flowers over here. So it's give and take due to probabilities, and independent assortment and everything. But the higher the number becomes, you see like the higher these numbers, like thousands, the closest they're going to be to a ratio of three to one. So that's what Mendel was trying to figure out at that point. And then you just let me move forward over here. And that's why in the first generation, we saw only purple flowers. But then in the second generation, we saw 75% of, of purple and 25% of white. That's something really interesting, right? Because it jumped one generation, but actually these white alleles were always there. So they were just hidden by the dominant allele. Another example that we can work over here so we can get a grasp of this so we have a heterozygous brown fur rabbit, which is going to be like this. So my exercises on the exams are going to be very similar to these ones. So we have a heterozygous rabbit, which is this one over here. It's going to breed. So I'm gonna draw the Punnett square over here. Oops. So I'm is going to breed with a homozygous for white fur. So we have this one over here. So then when we make the combinations of the alleles, then this is what we are going to obtain. This, uh, this by this, and then this with this, and then again, this by this, and then this by this, and the last one. Um, let me ask you now, now when we have completed our Punnett square, let me ask you, what is the percentage in genotype? What is the percentage of homozygous dominant? Homozygous dominant should be something like this, B, capital B, capital B. Zero. Zero, yeah, zero percent. What would be the percentage of homozygous recessive? 50. 50, because there are these two guys over here. Uh -huh. And what are the chances of uh, heterozygous? 50. 50, exactly, because 25% this and 25% this, so they make 50. This is genotype. When I'm speaking about now phenotype, which is the observable characteristic, I'm speaking about the color of the fur. So what percentage of rabbits are going to be brown? Considering that brown is going to be dominant over white. 50. Uh-huh, 50%. And I see in the chat, everybody's saying 50. Oh, exactly, because these ones are going to be heterozygous, but they will have the white allele, but they will be overcome by dominant brown. And what percentage of um, these rabbits are going to have a white fur? 50. 50%, exactly. So 50% is going to be these guys over here. All right, so you're getting the hold of these ones. So let's go a little bit more complicated. So we're going to last uh, probably like another 20, 30 minutes over here because this is going to help you a lot for the extra credit for the lab on uh, Wednesday. So a parent has blood type AB. Okay, so let's make the square over here so, so we can start putting information over here. 
So parent is going to be having type plot AB, which by the way, they are codominant. So anyone, if you have type um, blood type AB, that means that you are going to have both expressing at the same time. So the type uh, blood AB usually are universal donor uh, receptors, so they can receive any type of blood. So say there's an accident and they go to the hospital and they, they are AB, even the doctors say like, thank God, because you can use, put in any type of, uh, of blood and the blood is going to be acceptable for them, right? But then, so a parent has blood type AB, which we put in our radio over here. And the other parent is going to be homozygous recessive for type O. So then we have an O over here and an O over here, okay? So then the question is describe the phenotypes and genotypes of the offspring. So if we make the Punnett square, then we're going to have A, O, and then B, O, and then A, O, and B with this one. So this is going to be B, O. So can you describe to me what are the uh, can you describe the chances of having children with type blood O? O is recessive. I remember zero. Zero. Yeah. Thank you. So zero percent. Remember, like recessive um, uh, homozygous recessive are going to express only when they are together, and you don't see any O O together right here. What are the chances of uh, having type? Uh, Blood type A? 50. 50, yeah, thank you. And what about for type blood B? 50. And what about for type blood AB? Zero. Zero, there you go, thank you, exactly. So in my case, I am not, I'm telling you my true, true um, example of this one. So I know that my brother and my sisters are, one of my sister, one of my sisters, he is type blood a. I am type blood A. My mother is type blood O. So that means that my mom has to be forcibly homozygous recessive for type blood O. So my mom is going to be OO. So this is just like almost by mere logic that I, I was doing it. So my dad is type blood A. But then on the other side, we didn't know if he was AA or AO or AB. But the fact is like I know that my dad is going to be type blood O because my other siblings, I have near five in total, so that's a good experiment. So my other siblings are going to be type blood O. So then if you make the Punnett square over here, you have O, O, you have A, O, and you have O, O. So there is a chances that uh, my sister and I are going to be, I mean, with all the chances, my sister and I are going to be heterozygous or type load A, and my other siblings, my other two sisters and my brother are going to be homozygous or type blood O. I know that they are not, my dad is not AB because AB are codominant. So let me, I don't know why my screen keeps making funny things over here. Give me one second, oops. Give me one second over here. What happened with this? Give me one second, my computer is just, the screen is just like all lines and everything, and I see myself three times in the same screen. Um, um, give me one second. I'm sorry for this. I have technical difficulties right now. Um, what happened? Oh, there you go. There you go. Can you see the screen now? Yeah, okay, thank you. So as I was saying, if my dad were would be if my dad would be B, 
then they are codominants. So then all of us could be type log AB. So if my other siblings are O, then I know that my dad is going to be heterozygous for type blood A, and I am al also this type of uh, genotype. So then I know that my wife, she is also type blood O. So then it's going to be the exact same for the square, because if I am heterozygous for uh, this type of blood for A, and she is OO, then my daughter will have 50% chances of being type blood A or 50% chances of being type blood O. So the same probabilities can be applied for the type of, um, the, the, type of um, the color of the eyes, the shape of the hair, and then we're gonna be working during the lab with more other phenotypes so that we can understand better like these type of probabilities. On the other side, we have something with incomplete dominance. So in the case of incomplete dominance, remember we are going to reach something called like an average. So we're going to get something in between. So we are going to have, and that's a, a, an experiment that Mendel also was trying to do. So we have uh, the stem length of the pea plants and they have the long with the capital L and the short lowercase l. So then the long is gonna exhibit incomplete dominance. That means that the intermediate phenotype is going to be like a, like a middle size stem. So what is the probability, and I didn't write properly over here, of when you are breeding two true uh, breedings from each one of them? So when I'm speaking about true breedings, it's like I'm having a homozygous dominant by a homozygous recessive. So if we make the Punnett square over here, we're gonna make the square, ta -da -da, ta -da -da. we have the dominant, over here and then the recessive over here. So then we have uh, heterozygous, this by this, and then this by this is going to give me this similar. And then this by this is going to be the same. And this by this is going to give me the same. So if you can see over here, 100% of them are going to be heterozygous, right? So no homozygous dominance, no homozygous recessive at all we're going to give 100% heterozygous. But since, since they show incomplete dominance, that means that these, homo, these uh, heterozygous, instead of having either a long stem or a short stem, uh, stem sorry, they're going to show an intermediate length of stem. So that's what these uh, example is trying to tell you over here. So we're going to get an average with incomplete dominance, right? That makes sense to everyone? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now, so you know, like they say that there are 50% chances of having a girl and 50% chances of having a boy. Right? So this is for the sex determination in humans and thousands of other organisms with sexual reproduction. So even if you consider that a, a male is going to be XY and a female is going to be in XX, right? So oh, this is an X. So if you count how many chromosome X we have, we have one, two, and three, right? three chromosomes X and only one chromosome Y. So we could quickly say like, oh, there are 75% chances of getting a female and 25% chances of getting a male because you, you have a ratio of three to one and that's it. But actually, if we do a Punnett square, say this is a female, and we finish doing the Punnett square over here. And then you have the male on this side. So let's, this is a Y. So X by X, 
So we are getting a female, x by x. We are going getting another female, and x and y. We are getting a male. Well, I don't know why this keeps making this. And then another x and y. We are getting that actually 50% of the probabilities are going to be for a female and 50% chances for a male. Even if we have only one Y chromosome, but now when we apply Mendelian genetics to um, sex determination, then we can actually know that there are 50-50% chances of having a girl or a boy, right? So now everything makes sense. And actually the one that determines the sex at the end of everything is going to be the first sperm that is going to fertilize the egg. Because in general, females are going to provide only X chromosomes or X alleles, and then, but it is the male that is going to be providing the Y allele over here. So back in time, and even right now, like in other cultures and everything, every time that a female has a girl, I know we have really misogynistic cultures in many other countries, they always blame on the woman. They say, ah, it is the woman's fault that I'm having a girl because they don't want to have a girl, they want to have a boy because it's the pride of the family and blah, 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 all the BS that they have in those cultures. But actually, if you notice, it is on the males that actually these probabilities changes everything. So actually, when people say that it's the woman in those cultures that it is her fault, actually it's not. Actually, it is the fault of the males that are providing these different types of chromosomes. That makes sense to you now? So now you can explain that you can play with probabilities and maybe if one of you knows somebody has 10 children, so then probably the bigger the sample size, probably they would have six and four or five and five because the bigger the sample size, the more accurate is, uh, are these uh, results over here. So say, I think Juliana has a girl and a boy, Right, so the 50, 50% 50 chances, they work perfectly over here. If I'm not wrong, right, Juliana, you have a boy and a girl? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so exactly these chances happened over here of 50, 50 over there. So that's, it. Juliana is a perfect example of Mendelian genetics happening over there. Uh -huh. All right, so next move, let's uh, move to the next one. And don't forget when you're doing Punnett squares, one side, then the other side, and they have to match in every single one, this and this, this and this, this and this, and then last this and this, and then you can make your probabilities. Each square is equal 25%. Homozygous dominant are capital, uh, capital letters, Homozygous recessive are lowercase and heterozygous with one capital, one lowercase. Now, in the case of the carrier diseases, if you hear like somebody, uh, the woman or the, you know, or the guy is carrying a genetic disease that is going to transfer to the next generation. So say, for example, the mother of uh, the children or a child is going to be the carrier for recessive disease. So in these cases for uh, carrier diseases, we are going to make it a little bit different because this is mostly related with the X and Y chromosome. So in the case of these ones, we're gonna see it during the lab, then we have to put like, the information says over here, a mother is a carrier of a recessive disease. So she's heterozygous. So what we do is like, we, if, we, if it is like this, we have to put like, she is heterozygous, we're gonna um, make it a little bit different because it's sex related. So we can put that actually, since she's heterozygous, we're gonna have it like X and X. So she's going to be providing the X chromosomes. One of them is going to be uh, the normal and the other one is going to be the recessive carrier of the disease. 
And then the question is asking, let me try to figure out here, that a she is going to have children with a non-carrier male. So non-carrier is going to be a dominant like this. So the male is going to be X capital H and then the Y, and the Y, since it's a different chromosome, is not going to contain anything. It's just going to be blank over here on top. So then when we make the mixes over here, I'm just gonna omit the H over here, uh, um, the X, but I'll try to put it because this mouse is horrible. So we have like, they can have 25% chances of having a little girl that is going to be Okay, so it's going, it's not going to be a carrier. It's going to be having both alleles normal. Also, they can have another female that can be a carrier just like her mom. Then they can have a male that will have normal life without the disease, but then there is 25% chances since this allele is going to be by itself and there is nothing over here to cover up for this one, we have 25% chances that we have a boy that is going to express the disease. What if this disease is a heart failure or diabetes or something like that? So then they, we will have like 25% chances that the boy only will develop the disease. And then the females are going to be okay. So this example is also applied to when males start losing the hair because this is the same example when we lose hair and we go bald. So I hope that I will never go bald, but if not, it's okay. I'm just gonna shave it and that's it. No, no, I mean, I'm not like hiding anything if I will lose my hair or anything like that. But this is an example of how, why we get the baldness in males, but we don't get baldness in females. But also this could be applied for diseases like this. So there are going to be three or four exercises during the lab that we will work on that, okay? So this link I'll send to you later too. I want to uh, update and send it. We have like practice quiz for Mendel uh, Mendelian genetics. So you can practice more quiz and more Punnett squares and everything. You can have it over here. The extra credit is all about Punnett squares. So you can publish your techniques of Punnett squares over there. So environment so it's gonna last probably like 15 uh, let's say like around 8 20 when i finish a little bit longer this class um environmental factors are going to influence expression of the genotype as we spoke before with that gene expression to so say if you see these plants planted in the garden like this one sometimes it's not only the gene that is uh, going to be like oh this one has a recessive and this one is a dominant but actually what's going to happen is just like the acidity of the soil is going to affect the gene expression as well. So there are going to be a lot of factors, both genetic and environmental, and collectively, as it says over here, they're going to influence the phenotype of, um, of um, say for example, in this one, the skin tanning. So say, say um, like my descendant, my, my ascendants actually, my great, great, great grandfather, great grandfather back in time, probably thousands of years, they live in environments in which we needed to have a darker skin because we were receiving a lot of UV light living in the tropics and these areas over there. So that's why we developed more melanin and then we develop a darker skin color like that. But again, as I was saying, it's just matter of a variety of a gene that exists in all humans and uh, that's what happens over there. So it's just like multifactorial, uh, or it's just like many factors happening at the same time. It's just a combination of everything that is happening around us that it will make some of your genes be active or not. So then lastly, what about the pedigree? 
So the pedigree analysis is something that is very interesting to do. We are going to work on a little bit of that uh, for the laboratory. So there is a way in how we are going to write a pedigree uh, on a scientific way. The squares on a pedigree are going to represent um, a male. Circles are going to represent females, like you say, so we're here. Horizontal lines, that means that there is um, in the case of mating, like these ones, they probably got married or they were just loving each other. So then they had children, which is the vertical lines right below in the middle of them means that they had children. So this is going to be the oldest one, which is a girl. And then you move on like this by uh, age in which they were born. So there was a girl, then there was a boy, then there was a boy, then there was a boy. And usually when they have a dark color, this one, that means that this is the character or the phenotype that you are trying to follow. So that's what it says over here, shaded symbols, self for individuals with a trait being tracked. So say you're trying to track um, the uh, skin color or the eye color, which are like the easiest ones to follow for the traits. And then you know that your parents, they have this type of um, eye color and then your grandfathers, they have this type of color. So then you can start making your uh, pedigree and start realizing that there might be some patterns of Mendelian genetics in all their traits. So that's, for example, again, the pedigree charts. This is the trait that you're following, like this one's over here. And males, again, squares and females are circle. So, and let me see. So this is caused by a dominant allele. Usually the disease, and let me just keep some of it over here later. Um, okay, there you go. So usually when you have autosomal traits like this one, autosomal means that it's not related to the sex chromosomes. You're going to see that there is no real pattern between if only boys or only girls have it, you're gonna see a general distribution among all of the, in, in all the pedigree. But then when you're talking about sex related uh, traits or genetic traits, you're gonna notice that most of the males are going to be the ones that they will possess that specific trait. Like the baldness, for example, is one of the traits that is going to be related like that. In this case, for example, you can see that all females are going to have this specific trait, but not the females like this one. They will not contain anything like that. So this is something that we will work and I want to explain more during the laboratory because we'll make an analysis like this one. But say when you have like an X-linked dominant, which is going to be related to sex, uh, most of the females are going to contain this uh, uh, trait. When it is recessive, most of the males are going to be the ones that are going to have this specific trait, all right? And then, um, for example, let me just jump to the next one. I think this is, uh, no, this is, let me show you another example over here. I don't have it over here. Just give me one second, there you go. So for example, like hemophilia in the uh, European royalty, as you can see over here, most of the people who have hemophilia in this genial, genial pedigree are going to be males, as you can see. The ones that are half like here, that means they are you know, just carriers, but the ones that actually have this disease or this uh, disorder are going to be the males. So this is something really true based on, um, on the uh, pedigree of, um, of uh, European uh, royalty, all the way to Philip and Elizabeth, and then William and Harry and everything. So they don't have this uh, disorder, but some of them over here, they actually had the disorder over here. So you can see actually just by the way, the Russian, Kings, the Sars before are actually related 
to the royalty of England. So all these guys were just having interbreeding and breeding between the same families in order to keep uh, the, the power. But at the same time, then they were doomed of having some of their children, the male children, having this hemophilia, which is a sex-linked recessive trait. Baldness, as I was explaining to you before, this is another trait that is related to that. And actually, also the color blindness, and females usually are not color, color blind, but uh, we as uh, males, we could be color blind. So if all the guys over here, can you see the number over here? Which number do you see over here? Or if the girls can tell me. 29, 29 45, uh -huh. I don't know what that one is, but then there's 26. And this is a 47, right? This is a 47 over here and this one over here. Just kidding, just kidding. There is nothing over there. <laughs> it's some design. Yeah. It's just like a weird design with weird shapes and everything. So yeah, uh, exactly. I was just scaring you over there. So yeah, usually women are capable to see it. And the color blindness is, is going to happen in the case of males. So normal vision is going to be, you're going to be able to see this. Then for the red green color, if one of the guys over here is a red green color blind, you won't be able to see B and D. And with the red color blind for B, you won't be able to see it, the 45 over here. And then for the green color, um, you won't see also the uh, the B over here because everything is going, going to look the same color. So that's sometimes that's the test that uh, they give you to know if you're color blind or not. And that's it. And questions for review, I'm going to leave it over here. Um, what is a gene? So we have to remember that a gene is just a sequence of DNA that is going to encode for a specific function, RNA or protein. Alleles, remember, are just variations of one gene. Again, the same example of the eye color, blue, brown, black, hazel, gray, green, etc., etc. Uh, the differences between dominant and recessive alleles are, is going to be that dominant alleles are going to overcome and express in presence of a recessive. A recessive is not going to express. Uh, homozygous dominant and re recessive and hetero heterozygous homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive are going to contain the same type of allele. It's either capital 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 or lowercase lowercase. And in the case of heterozygous, it's going to be one capital one lowercase. In expression is the way how our genes are going to express depending on of our um, genetic. Uh, factors and the environmental factors surrounding us. Phenotype and phenotype. Remember, phenotype is just the physical characteristics and genotype is just the genetic sequence or the DNA sequence of an organism in general. Incomplete dominance is when the two alleles, they meet an agreement and they have an average of the phenotype. Codominance is when the two phenotypes are going to express at the same time. The huskies with different eye colors, that's the codominance. Um, don't forget that we have to review these uh, extra credit exercises for Punnett squares so that you can work on that. So now later you can sit on, you can see it on the table and be like, okay, so Let's see my wife or my husband or my partner or my parents, they actually one has brown eyes and blue eyes. So what would be the probabilities of me and my siblings? So you can